Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. It's Gene. Happy Thanksgiving. I'm shooting this on uh, Thanksgiving Day 2021, so I hope everybody's having a nice one out there. I'm going to talk to you today about the PC12 Climb Profile. Uh, this one came in uh, by request from Seatback Pocket. Uh, great question. Thought we would uh, just kind of start from a takeoff and I'll take you all the way through climb up to cruise. So I just uh, banged out this nifty little graphic here on. Uh, Microsoft Paint because uh, I'm old school like that and don't really know how to use the other more fancy programs. So uh, excuse the rudimentary nature of this thing here, but uh, I think I'll be able to get the point across pretty well. Anyway, so we'll start down here on the ground and uh, I've actually omitted the actual takeoff procedure on this little graphic here just because uh, I've talked about that in, in my uh, previous videos. But uh, after we're up and off the runway, we'll start right here at a positive rate. So once we have a positive rate, we're going to tap the brakes and select gear up. And the reason that we tap the brakes is because we don't want the mains spinning at a high rate of speed up in the gear wells after the gear retracts because there could be fod or debris, uh, who knows, gravel, whatever it might be. You know, there could be mud on those tires. And if those are spinning at a really fast rate of speed, some of that debris could come off in the wells and actually damage things in the wells. So um, that's the reason we want to stop those mains uh, before we retract the gear. <clears throat> no way to stop the nose wheel because that doesn't have a brake, but uh, that's okay. And then we engage the uh, yaw damper right away. And the reason we want to do that is to prevent any Dutch roll in the climb. Uh, the PC-12 does have a tendency to Dutch roll without the yaw damp engaged, as do many airplanes. So we do want to get that on pretty much as soon as we're in the air. Uh, and then we'll turn off our taxi and landing lights. And the reason we do that is because we don't want the taxi and landing lights uh, burning in the wells. So they do have uh, micro switches. They are supposed to turn off automatically upon gear retraction. But just in case there's a malfunction there, we go ahead and turn them off with the buttons or switches as well. And uh, at that point, we're going to be pitching for either VX or VY as appropriate. So VX is our best angle of climb speed. VY is best rate of climb. And if you're not familiar with these, VX means, uh, again, the best angle of climb is the greatest gain in altitude over distance. And VY best rate of climb is the greatest gain in altitude over time. So VX will yield a steeper climb as viewed from a profile uh, view. VY will be the most economical climb. So we use VX and in the PC-12 at sea level at max gross is uh, 120 knots if we have any obstacles. So obstacles would be things like, you know, um, trees, high terrain, you know, buildings, things like that. We're going to use VX until we're clear of those obstacles. And then at that point, transition over to a VY climb. And VY in the PC-12 at sea level at uh, max gross is 130 knots. So it's only a 10 knot difference. Now, normally you don't have obstacles. So usually as soon as you're off the, the runway, you're going to be pitching for VY about 130 knots. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll select the appropriate airspeed based on the, the airport conditions or the surrounding area. And then as soon as we're at at least 100 knots indicated airspeed and 400 feet AGL, will retract the flaps. Now this is assuming that we're flying a normal takeoff, not a short field takeoff. If we were flying a short field takeoff, we would have our flaps set to 30 degrees, not 15 degrees, and there would be an additional step in here that uh, I didn't list. So this is assuming a normal takeoff. So again, we should be over 100 knots, but we just want to check to make sure we're at least 100 knots before we uh, retract the flaps and the reason for that is because when we retract the flaps we reduce the camber of the wing we reduce the the lift and we don't want to do that at too slow of an airspeed otherwise we could risk stalling the wing and we wait until 400 feet agl because we really don't want to be fussing around with changing the shape of the wing and and having to trim and and kind of mess with all that at too low of an altitude there's really no big rush. You shouldn't really be in a, in a hurry to retract the, the flaps on takeoff. They're not really hurting anything being out uh, and 400 feet comes really fast. So it's just a good number. Some people use 200 feet. Um, some use a little bit higher. 400 feet I think works pretty well. <clears throat> so flaps would come up there. And then at 400 feet AGL, we'll make our initial turn if appropriate per our departure procedure and or clearance. And so what that means is if we're at an airport that 
is in pretty flat terrain with not a lot of obstacles around at 400 feet. Typically, we could make our initial turn on course. So if we were assigned a heading out of a diverse vector area by ATC, for instance, we would wait until we were at 400 feet to go ahead and make that turn. Uh, so we would fly runway heading until 400 and then we would make the turn. Or if we're flying an actual SID or obstacle departure procedure, depending on what the procedure says to do, uh, we would make the appropriate turn. So in some cases, uh, if we're in high terrain and we're flying an ODP that requires runway heading to a certain altitude, we're, we're obviously not going to turn at 400 feet. We would turn at the higher altitude as prescribed by that procedure. Uh, but typically, you are going to end up turning at 400 feet in, in most situations. And a quick note on these altitudes here, um, we're using the radar altimeter for these uh, because it's a quick and convenient way to check to see roughly what our, our AGL altitude is. Um, and it's easier than, than doing the math in your head of adding you know, the 400 feet to the airport elevation that you took off from. So we just look at the radar altimeter and as soon as we're at 400 feet, we're gonna um, complete these items here. All right, and then once we get up to 1,000 feet AGL, <clears throat> we're gonna set our climb power. And uh, this, uh, this schematic, or you know, if you can call it that, this drawing is based on the legacy. Um, the NG has slightly different procedures, so this is assuming we're flying a legacy here. We're gonna set the climb power, and there is a, an actual power reduction that we're gonna make in the legacy at 1,000 feet to set climb power back to uh, the top of the green arc. Uh, and at that point, we can accelerate to 150 knots, indicated airspeed, cruise climb, and perform our after takeoff checklist. And remember that the after takeoff checklist is just that. It's a checklist and not a read and do list, meaning the after takeoff flow has already been accomplished down here with these items. So for instance, retracting the gear, retracting the flaps, turning on the odd amp, turning off the taxi and landing lights, etc. Th those are all the items that we're going to end up checking with that after takeoff checklist, plus a couple of other things. We're going to make sure that we're pressurizing and, and a couple other things. But at this point, we'll pull the actual checklist out and accomplish that at 1,000 feet. Sometimes it happens a little bit above 1,000 feet, depending on your workload. Uh, but somewhere around there is where we want to get that accomplished. So you can see that you know our workload below 1,000 feet is pretty high. You've got several action points below a thousand feet and then at a thousand feet. And then once you're above a thousand feet, you're on course, you've got it trimmed out or the autopilot engaged for a cruise climb. You've got your climb power set. Things slow down quite a bit and you can start to look outside and enjoy the scenery a little bit until 10,000 feet. So 10,000 MSL, we're going to close the inertial separator. Some people don't know what the inertial separator is. It is a, uh, it's a little door on the lower cowling that opens up and it creates a pathway for anything that's heavy, any fod or debris that's ingested into the engine to fly out and exit that intake flow before it makes the nearly 180 degree turn back around into the compressor of the engine. So that's why it's called the inertial separator because anything with inertia anything other than basically clean air like a bird or any type of debris is anything that has some weight to it and is at least somewhat heavy is going to actually fall out of that open door that open pathway through the inertial separator before it's ingested into the compressor of the engine and does damage to the engine so we do want to have that inertial separator open at the lower altitudes to protect us against damage from FOD now, different operators have <clears throat> different policies on that. I flew for an operator that wanted the separator open below 2000 AGL, and I've also flown for operators that wanted it open below 10,000 MSL. So uh, generally speaking, you know, you're not really gonna encounter much that can damage the engine other than ice um, above 10,000 feet. And in fact, 10,000 feet is pretty conservative. Normally, you know, be, I would say above two, three, four, maybe 5,000 feet. Um, you kind of stop seeing most birds and there's not really a lot up there that you need to worry about ingesting into the engine. So kind of the downside of having the inertial separator open is that it does rob us of a little bit of power because we are diverting some of the airflow away from the engine. So we're not getting as much combustion in the engine. So we do lose a little bit of torque. We do have a little bit of an increase in ITT and, uh, we just generally lose a little bit of performance with it. We don't have as, as uh, 
ideal of fuel economy with it open, etc. So we don't just want to fly around with it open all the time, but we definitely want to have it open at the lower altitudes to protect the engine. Certainly any time that we're taxiing, taking off, landing, the initial climb, um, or you know, approach and you know the, the approach phase, we definitely want to have it open for sure. Uh, or anytime we're in icing conditions. There is actually a little mesh screen uh, just after the separator when the airflow is making the turnaround into the engine to actually catch any ice, any super cool droplets or any ice that comes around and it forms on that screen before it makes its way into the engine so that the engine is at least somewhat protected from ice. So just a little side note there. So as we close the separator, uh, we do want to monitor the torque and IT2. We're going to see a little bit of a change in both, and we just want to make sure that we're not exceeding 720 degrees Celsius on the ITT. And then we're going to turn off our recognition lights uh, at 10,000 feet. Some people leave those on to 18,000 feet. And in jets, we uh, normally leave the lights on until 18,000 uh, because at 18,000 feet, class alpha airspace starts. And that means everyone up above 18,000 feet is on an IFR flight plan. So you don't really have to worry too much about people up there that ATC doesn't know about. Uh, but certainly below 18, you do. Most of VFR guys that it would be a concern are below 10,000 feet. So usually in turboprops, we'll turn the, the lights off at 10,000. And then we'll do the climb checklist to the line. And what that means is the climb checklist is actually separated with a literal horizontal line. And you're going to do the items that are above the line uh, at 10,000 feet and save the items that are below the line until up here at 18,000 feet. So uh, we're going to be checking things like the pressurization system. We want to make sure the, that the uh, cabin, I mean, is pressurizing. Uh, everything's working normally there and uh, just monitoring the uh, climb power, the lights, that kind of thing. And then uh, at 18,000 feet MSL, we're gonna set the altimeters to standard, entering uh, the class alpha airspace, and then we're gonna pitch up to 140 knots cruise climb. And the reason we do that is because we actually um, have a little, little bit less ram air pressure up there at the higher altitudes because the air thins out so considerably that it's not actually that we're going slower, as a matter of fact, the true airspeed increases with altitude because we have less dense air, so there's less resistance for the airplane to uh, fly forward through. But we also see less ram air pressure into the pitot tube, so we're registering a lower airspeed. So we have to uh, correct for that as we climb and continue to pitch for lower climb speeds at the higher altitudes. So we're going to pitch up to 140 knots. Uh, cruise climb above 18,000. We're going to check our oxygen masks. There's a little test button on the mask that you press and you'll hear some O2 come out of it and that just lets you know that the mask is indeed working. It has pressure. We check that on the ground uh, during the receiving flow, but we also want to check it at 18 just to make sure that as we enter those higher flight levels that we do have indeed a working mask should we need it in a hurry if we lose pressurization. And then we'll do the climb checklist below the line at 18 and then we're pretty much done so if we are climbing above flight level 220 which happens fairly regularly in the pc-12 but certainly not every flight uh, at that point we would transition to 130 knot cruise climb and that would carry us pretty much all the way up to as high as we would want to go if you're going all the way up to like flight level 300 or something which almost no one does then uh you know, in the in the mid to high 20s, you would want to transition to 120 knots uh, cruise climb, but that normally doesn't happen. So, uh, and then away you go. So that's a, a typical climb profile with a normal takeoff in the Legacy PC-12. I uh, hope that answers some questions for you guys. Please let me know if you have additional questions or other video ideas for me. I'd be glad to hear them. I hope everyone's having a nice Thanksgiving out there. Thanks for watching, guys. Please like and subscribe uh, if you're liking these videos. That helps me out a lot, and I will see you on the next one. Thanks.